Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment. Today's show is going to be all about the Micro Cinema 4K um, camera, which I had the box for. Darn it. Hey, um, hmm, where did I put the box for that thing? Darn it, I don't know where I put it. Oh, well. I did an unboxing video. You can go back and watch that to see what the box looks like if you really care. But the camera is now integrated completely into my switching system. And we're going to talk about kind of a first level look at it. So first off, let's just take a look at the physical camera in place. It is, it is right there. So I'm going to walk over to that camera now and show you what this thing looks like. So it's covered up with my, uh, my uh, black cloth because that's a, what do you call it, a um, teleprompter screen on there. So that's that. Let me just zoom into this a little bit now that I've pulled that off of there. And I want to show you what we've got here. So this camera, now I was talking about using this lens at one point. This is the motorized Lumix lens. It's a zoom lens with a little you know, motor in it. And the cool thing about the motor was that you could control zoom um, from the camera, which you can do, but you can't save it. You can't macro it. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Also, the lens wasn't fast enough for my lighting situation, so I ended up going back to my f2.8, uh, 24 to 70 equivalent, 12 to 35. But on this camera, you've got here HDMI out. This is plugging into a television right now, and this is just for monitoring so that I can see the controls that I need to set on the camera. This cable is a breakout cable which goes to a whole bunch of bits and bobs. All I'm using on here is the power. That's where the power is. I'm not using any of the rest of this. Everything else comes through. I want to make sure I don't want to unplug the wrong one here. Everything else goes through mini SDI cables. And there's two of these. And this is part of why it took me a long time to get this thing up and running, because I had to order those cables. So, because um, they're standard SDI to mini SDI, I had to order them and get the right ones at the right length in here so that I could uh, connect this to my system. And the reason that there's two cables, and I, I just unplugged one for you, but the reason there's two cables is one of them is the video signal. That's your SDI out. That's your video signal. And the other one is a, um, it's a pro from the program from the ATEM back into the camera, and this is how we control it. So, I'm going to do this. Let me go full screen on here of the camera control, and I will switch over to this. So this is the camera control one here. And then I'll do a little picture in picture, move off to the side so you can see the camera controls. And I'll switch back a couple times so you can see the full thing. But this is the real power of this thing. Now before we get into all this, I want to talk about some of the setup. I took some notes on my setup experience that I wanted to share with you guys. Now um, let's start with the number one reason why I wanted to do this in the first place. The number one reason was because of the latency that I was getting between my GH4 with the HDMI out, and this is going to be any camera with an HDMI output, the latency between that and real time, which is about four frames on that camera. It might be different depending on your camera, but there's going to be a latency. If you take a Canon camera, this is your easiest way to see this, take a Canon camera, you don't even have to hook up the HDMI out. Open the, um, go into video mode so the mirror's up and you can see the live display, something it's called live view on the back of the camera, and just put your hand in front of it and move it, you can see the delay. That delay goes all the way through the HDMI chain and ends up being a sync issue with your audio. So I've talked about this at length before, but for anyone watching this new, let me just kind of, uh, let me briefly explain why this is so important and so complicated. It seems like, okay, if, you're, if you've got a delay between your audio and video, you can, you can delay one or the other and sync those up, and you can. If I was not on camera myself, monitoring myself being on camera, this would not be a problem. This is a problem because I myself am doing the switching, monitoring myself on camera. Basically, what happens is if, um, if there's a delay between the audio and the video, so audio is going through a soundboard, mixing board, straight into the switcher, and then the video from the camera is delayed by four frames, then it appears out of sync. It appears out of sync in live broadcast. If I'm recording it, I can change it later, but for live broadcast, it's out of sync. So the seemingly obvious easy solution is to route my audio, my dialogue, instead of through the mixer and straight into the switcher, is to route it into the camera. And then it picks up the same delay as the video, and it is therefore in sync. This would be perfectly fine if I wasn't monitoring myself. I need to monitor myself talking, and so therefore, by the time the audio comes back to me, it's four frames out of sync, and you hear yourself on echo, which is completely untenable. You cannot operate that way at all. So, believe me, I've had many, many discussions with a lot of smart people. There is no way around this. You have to remove the delay in the video. 
And this camera, the studio, um, the micro studio camera from Blackmagic does exactly that because it has native SDI output and it outputs the video in real time. There's no HDMI processing. The SDI output is real time. So what you're seeing right now is the live video feed from the camera. My dialogue is being routed through a big mixing board, which is going straight into the ATEM switcher. So I do not have my audio routing through the camera at all. And this is the way that it should be. This allows me now to not only hear myself in real time, to, for you to see me talking in real time, not four frames delay. It also allows me to monitor everything coming off of the ATEM. So if I take any other source and push it through the ATEM, I can hear that. And that's something else I was lacking before. So this is really, really cool setup. For more details on this, there are previous videos. There's one, um, we'll have to, I'll find the link to it. We'll stick it in the notes where it was kind of after my big live broadcast with my, um, my local Chamber of Commerce group, where I, I discussed a whole lot of tech stuff about that setup and what I learned in that experience. And this was basically just confirmed. I already knew this then, but I talked more about it there. So um, and you can watch that video if you want to learn more about that. Anyway, so now this works. So I've got the camera. You saw it's a tiny little camera, SDI straight up to the switcher, power cord, um, the HDMI out is just so that I can see the monitor. I don't have that patched into the switcher now. I will be doing a part two of this video, and at that point I'll show you that interface, but I don't have that patched in now, so I can't show you that. But what I can see on it is if I want to, I can I have a big TV in front of me, and I can see it on there so I can make adjustments. But once it's set, you don't need to touch it. So let's talk about some of the things that I did experience. Um, some of the questions that I had, and a lot of these questions I called tech support just to get answers to because I couldn't quite figure it out. Now, the very first thing when I started setting it up, I first thing out of the box, I had one of the right type of SDI cables. It was a short one, so I just sat at my switcher, plugged it in, and everything seemed to work. And I was just uh, like over the moon excited about this. This is working. Uh, it appears to be in real time. Uh, I was super happy. And then I ordered the cables that I needed and routed the cables and plugged everything in, plugged it into the right input, and fired it up. And I wasn't getting video properly. I was getting this weird orange cast over the video. I was going through everything, and I could not figure out why I'm getting this orange cast over the video. Called tech support. Turns out, so in the camera, there is an ID when you're in the, mo um, in the settings. You can set a camera ID. And in my mind, I thought that was just for your own reference. This is going to be camera one. So I, I think it was set by default to camera one. I just left it at camera one because that's what it is. It's my main camera. Thing is, that ID actually has to correspond with the input on your ATEM switcher. So I have that camera routed into input six. Just because of the way things are configured, that's where it goes. So it goes into input six. Turns out that I had to set the camera ID to match the input. As soon as I set the camera ID to input six, everything came up right, the colors were right, everything was, I had camera control, everything. I, yeah, I wasn't having camera control before, so weird. ID, so that's step number one. You have to set the camera to the correct ID. And when I show you the interface, in a future video, I'll show you where to set that. But that is critical, number one thing. Get that set up, and then you can do everything else from there. Uh, one of the questions that I had for the Blackmagic folks was, can I change the camera resolution from the ATEM? So I, when I'm doing live broadcasts like this, I'm operating in 1080p 24. When I'm recording for, not for live broadcasts, but for recorded videos for clients and so on, then I shoot in 4K. So I'm in UHD, Ultra HD, uh, also at 24p, usually. I want to know if I could change that. I couldn't figure out if I could change that from the ATEM switcher. You can't. So you have to go to the camera to change it. Now, that's not a big deal because it's not something that you're going to be switching on the fly, but, um, but it's one of the things, if you're mounting the camera in a really remote, hard to get to location, that is something to think about. You do need to physically get to it. Now, with that said, remember that breakout cable that I showed you. There's a cable on there that it, uh, it's designed for you to create your own cables to do pretty much anything you want. It's feasible, I suppose, that maybe you could control that remotely if you had the right cable connection in there, but I kind of don't think so. It's not, when I talked to tech support, they didn't even mention that as a possibility. But it is one of those things where you can take insane control over this camera uh, remotely if you get into crafting your own cables, way beyond what I want to do, but just so you know that's there. Okay, so that was, that was the second thing. You cannot control the camera remotely. Okay, um, white balance. So this has been a really interesting thing. So let's compare a couple things between using the micro studio camera that we're using now versus the GH4, or any other camera really. On a, a camera like the GH4, this is something you'll get in any DSLR or DSLM. Obviously you have white balance settings like daylight, tungsten, shade, whatever. You have those settings you can preset in. And then you can go into color temperature and manually set it uh, in, are they 10 degrees Kelvin increments? Um, either 10 or 100 degree Kelvin in increments, but it's, it's pretty uh, granular. You can set the degree, the temperature to exactly what you want. 
Or my absolute favorite way to set white balance is to take a gray card, out of the way now, but take a gray card, point the camera at it, go into custom white balance mode and say, that's your target, boom, it snaps a picture of it or just meters off of that and your white balance is set and it's flawless. It's super fast, it's super easy, it's super accurate, love that. This camera doesn't do that. It also doesn't even give you granular white balance settings. You have, I think it was a total of uh, 18 different settings. And for the daylight balanced area, which is where this room is, this is roughly daylight balanced, it is, your settings are 5,000, 50, 200, 50, 400, 50, 600. If your white balance doesn't fall into one of those, tough. It, it, you can't get accurate white balance. Or so I thought. So then I start playing around with it and I realize that we have within the camera controls, now let's take a quick look at the, at the control setting here. We have for lift gamma and gain, I'll zoom in this a little bit, lift gamma and gain, you have individual RGB adjustments. And this right here in the gain is where I got my white balance looking accurate. And so this is something that we'll cover in and again, in part two, when I'll have to completely reroute the viewing so that you can see things like a like scopes in real time and so on. Um, and I'll show you how I balance that out. But effectively, I took a gray card and put that on camera, looked at it through scopes, which incidentally, you can't th do through the ATEM. You have to have extra, yet another piece of hardware to view scopes. I happen to have the Ninja Assassin, which does show scopes. So I was using that but I'm trying to get my hands on one of the um, one of the Blackmagic Ultra Scopes, which will allow me to get proper scope straight off the ATEM. It's another piece of hardware, it's like a $500 piece of hardware. Yet another thing to have. Um, anyway, th from there I was able to adjust the individual red, green, and blue gain levels to get those balanced out. So you absolutely can get a perfect, uh, perfect color balance, but as far as native white balance, you don't have that super accurate setting. So that's something something worth noting in there. It's, uh, it was definitely a bit of a bit of a bummer to discover that. Okay, in the settings, let's go back to the Mac here real quick. In the settings, you'll find two different gain controls. You have gain here like I was just talking about, and you have individual RGB settings in here. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to switch to a different camera because I don't want to mess up what we're actually looking at here. So we have different um, gain controls here that I can adjust with this dial, I can adjust all of them simultaneously, or I can click and drag on the individual red, green, and blue channels and tweak those. And then you also have another gain down here that starts at plus zero and it goes plus six, plus 12, plus 18, and then back to zero again. So I could not figure out if there was a difference between those two. I talked to tech support at Blackmagic and they say that there isn't. It's just a granularity difference and then of course the RGB in there. I guess, I'm not 100% convinced that I'd buy that. So I think a little testing is in order to take one at plus six, set it back to zero, set the other to plus six and see if it's identical. Um, something tells me there's a little bit different going on in there, but maybe it's not. That's what Blackmagic support says. So if we take them at their word for that, and they do tend to know what they're talking about, um, then they are the same. It just seems a little bit odd to me that you'd have such dramatically different settings in there. But then again, I'm not a broadcast guy to begin with, so maybe this is totally normal. That's the way broadcast things work. So you got that. Okay, uh, next one that came up. Oh, I already talked about the scopes. I asked Blackmagic if there's any way to get scopes on screen, because I know I'd seen somewhere on their website, and I couldn't remember where, views of people looking at their scopes in software on screen. And it turns out that you do need extra hardware for that. So that's the ultra scope. Let me, uh, let me pull that guy up. I didn't do this ahead of time, but let me pull this up real quick. Um, pull up the B&H site, and let's go to Blackmagic Ultra, ah, stop, Ultra Scope. Pocket. That's the one that I want. I know they have it. There it is, yeah. So let's get that up a little bit, make that bigger. Um, so this little guy, it's a tiny little hardware box. Let's see if they have other pictures of it here. Here we go. That has SDI in. So on this side, there's SDI input. So you take your program out of your ATEM into this. And then this side is just a USB. You plug that into a computer, and then you have software that you run on the computer to show you the scopes. And then you can get full-on scopes. In fact, let's uh, let's find that. We should look at this on the Blackmagic website because then we can see the scopes. Um, so we can find this quickly here. Um, Ultra scope pocket. Here we go. So here's the two different options. There's the full-on Ultra scope, which is a screen, uh, a dedicated piece of hardware that has your scopes on it. And then the Ultra scope pocket so there's the dedicated hardware again. Here we go. The Ultrascope Pocket, which is here. Well, I guess there's one that's a PCI card as well. Let's you have software like this. So now you get a screen via software 
um, like this that shows you all the data that you would need. So that's pretty cool. And frankly, it's one of those things that I think you need if you want to have your accurate color. So the way that I've done it, remember I said that I've, I'm switching, running mine through a black, um, sorry, through a uh, Ninja Assassin and I get scopes on there, but it's kind of limited. It's not this full on scopes. What I ended up doing to get it really accurate was initially capturing a couple seconds of video, running over to Final Cut, bringing it in there and looking at the scopes there. And then I figured out that I have, um, what's the software called? Um, from Blackmagic, it's, uh, uh, it's on the other computer, I can't look it up here. But um, anyway, it's a basic capture software that comes with Wirecast. So I had this software, so I was able to feed my video directly into the Mac, capture it in Wirecast. So I'd capture a couple seconds and then immediately drag that into Final Cut. Couldn't get a live feed going into Final Cut. Um, and then I was able to adjust the scopes there. And I got really accurate. So now let's talk about that. Ah, come here. So I went, I took my Color Checker Passport guy and zoomed into this and so you got black white and this is a 40 IRE gray and then a dark gray um, so what I looked at was getting the scope so that this was just under 100 this was at zero or just above zero and then that was at 40 and so to do that I had to go back into the scopes here I had to well, here you can see it here enough um, adjust the gamma as well as the gain. So the gain got me, and I, let me preface, I'm saying, I don't actually know if I'm doing this right. <laughs> this is what I figured out on my own, and it worked. So I think this is right. But I basically, I used the gain to get my white point right, um, lift to get my black point right. So you can see lift has been adjusted as well. And then gamma, oh, there, we're not even looking at the right camera. Let's look at the right camera. Here we go, this is the actual camera. Um, so I adjust my gain to get the white point right. The lift and the gamma to get the midpoint, uh, the black and the midpoint right. Now, I got it so it was technically accurate, but it didn't look good to me. The, the mids were too, too high. So I ended up bringing them back down, which is what you're seeing now. And it's still not as good of a, uh, an image as I had off the, um, the GH4, but we'll get into that. So this, I had it technically accurate. I had the, that middle gray at 40 IRE where it's supposed to be, but it just, didn't feel right, so I started playing with a little bit more. So that brings me into another thing. These numbers here that you see, it seems like, uh, yeah, you can't actually go in here and type these numbers in. So if I start dragging this around, uh, see, I don't want to do that on here. That's we're going to see this live one change, and I will do that in a moment here. If I start dragging these around, you know, you see 0 0.08, 0 0.07, you think, oh, well, that's that's accurate, right? Not accurate at all. If I go to zero on this, and then I take this and I start dragging it you'll notice I can actually move it quite a bit before the numbers change. And you think, okay, well, that's just kind of weird UI. Turns out it's not. Um, turns out that there are seven decimal places of, of accuracy that are hidden from the user here. You cannot go in here and type in a number. I can't click on this and type in a number. All I can do is drag this until I see a number or drag it a little bit between the numbers and just find something that looks good. That ain't good enough. So what I discovered is that if you save out a macro, so you create a macro that's to save these color settings, um, and to do that, basically, you hit record on the macro, fiddle the colors a little bit. Doesn't matter where you go, you fiddle them, and that will that will um, embed it into the macro that creates the script in the macro. And then you can go into a text editor, open up your macro, and let's see here. Let me find what did I call it. Um, I have one in here that I did the other day, color change, there we go. So let me go into here, search for color change. There we go. Here we go, let's take a look at this. Here, zoom into that. Here are the color values that you can set. So you can set, so that's R, G, and B in there. You can set up to seven decimal places of accuracy, but that means that you have to actually go in and alter the, the uh, XML code of the macro and then reload that back into your switcher to get that really accurate color place. A little odd, frankly, but that's how you have to do it. So there's that. Um, so color accuracy. So let, let's, okay, let's talk a little bit more about this. Let's talk, let's play with the colors now that we're here. Uh, let's switch back to this guy. So I'm gonna switch to my live camera. So this is my live camera. You can see here, it says, um, well, now it doesn't say live anymore because it's not. Let me go back to the picture in picture there that you see the red on air just came up. So that's, this is controlling this picture here. 
I can now go in here and start making these changes to the settings. So things like the iris, I can take that, open up and open and close the iris, do a generic lift and gain control. I can do all of that in here. Great, now I've totally messed things up. Um, oh boy, I'm probably never going to get this back. Um, should have copied this first. You do have up here, let's show you this. You have the ability to copy all of your settings, and then you can paste them into another camera or paste them back into this camera. Um, I didn't do that. I'm going well, to hit copy there, but I think I screwed this up. Doesn't matter. Um, you can go in here and adjust the colors individually for lift, gamma, and gain. And so this is very much a Da Vinci type control. So I can go in here and I could say make my shadows a little bit blue. Let's go into like a little bit blue in the shadows. Let's take my my highlights, my gains. Let's push them towards red. And I can do all of this color control in real time. And you wouldn't really do this in real time, but you can. And you can also save all of this as a macro. So you could switch, let's say you're doing a live switching thing and I want to suddenly go moody. I could hit a button and have it go to a moody color look and so on. So I have this incredible, incredible amount of control in here. Now I've totally messed up my colors. Uh, let's paste my earlier one back in. And I know, like I said, I, I messed something up here earlier too. Oh well, say levy. Um, and you can just take complete and total control over the color. So right now, I don't feel that I have, I definitely don't have as good of color as I had off of the GH4. But off the GH4, I basically had just set to, I don't remember if I set the vivid look or natural look or anyway, it's just one of the in-camera looks, accurate white balance, obviously accurate exposure, and that's it. That's all I had to do and it looks great. Here, but that's all I could do. Here I have this incredible control, but I'm going to really have to take some time to dial this in and get it looking really, really right. So that is a... Um, a huge benefit to have this incredible amount of control, but a little bit of a drawback because it does take me a lot more, will take a lot more effort to get a really good look out of it. But you have that capability, so so there's that. All right, let's see here. Uh, talk about the scopes. Uh, oh, I asked Blackmagic if I could leave the camera on all the time because it's it's got a software power switch on it. It doesn't have a hardware switch, which means when I turn off the mains, most things in here are plugged into a couple of power strips. I flip the switch and everything goes off. Flip it back on, everything comes on. The camera has a soft button, which means I have to physically on the button, on the camera, push the button. And as you saw, it's kind of tucked away. It's under a cloth. I don't really want to have to go in there every time. He said there's no problem leaving it running all the time as long as it has ventilation. So we'll see um, with that cloth over there, which is not a real heavy cloth. I left it on last night. It didn't seem warm, so I think it's going to be okay doing it that way. All right, um, numerically adjusting the red, green, and blue settings for the lift, gamma, and gain. We talked about that. Ah, autofocus. Let's talk about autofocus. So this camera has, let me switch over to this real quick. You can see down here, there is a little knob. This close, that's not close, it's close, that's open and close. You think it would say closed, close. Anyway, that's for the iris. That is not for this dial here. This dial here is for focus, and this A is an autofocus button. Okay, well, let's switch back to this. And when I click the A to autofocus, um, well, let's watch. All oh, right, you can't see the box. So there's a box that is right in the middle of the screen, and it is trying to focus, and it is has failed. <laughs> it didn't focus. So let's see, I'm going to move me over here a little bit. Um, just give it something nice and easy to focus on, and try that again. Somebody's breaking something outside in the other room, and that focused on there. So autofocus works. It uh, You need to give it something in the right place to target on. Oh, it looks like I'm getting a little moray off of this shirt, too. I wonder if that's translating all the way through. Anyway, uh, autofocus works, but it's it's slower, which shouldn't be a problem. Uh, if you're doing this live, then I think you're probably manually focusing it anyway, if things were moving live. But with the GH4, one of the things that I liked about using it was I had it set to face autofocus, face detect, and I had a remote, so if I can reach this, is that coming to, yeah, it comes to the camera, um, a remote control, this is just the standard Panasonic remote control, push halfway to focus, push all the way to take a picture. I've got this on a long extension cable, and what I would do is every time I sat down, i will push that button halfway, look at the camera, push the button halfway, the face detection will lock on my face, focus on that, and I knew even if I was leaning forward, back, shift it over to the side, whatever, it was always going to focus precisely on my face. So that was really, really cool. Now, once it was set, I didn't adjust it during the shot, but every time I sat down, that was one of the things I would do. Partially, partially because every time I turned the camera off, it lost focus. You had to refocus it, but um, but it was nice knowing that it was locked on my face and it was fast. This is definitely slower, and it only focuses on one area, and it's not face detection. It's just there. So I kind of have to put something here, or if I'm wearing the right kind of shirt and I can sit there, it'll focus on me. So there's that. Okay, that is the extent of my note. Oh. Let's talk about the lens. So I talked about the, um, initially I had the zoom lens, the power zoom lens, and I was 
uh, planning on using that on here. Um, two reasons I'm not using it. Number one, it turns out that while I can control the zoom from the software interface as, as advertised, as you should, as you're um, told you can, you can't save that into a macro. So what I was hoping was that I could have a kind of wide shot preset and then go to a tight shot preset and it would zoom in, zoom out. Doesn't do that. And as I understand it, the reasoning is, is because the camera doesn't actually know the zoom control position. I guess the lens doesn't tell the camera where it's zoomed. It just has a near far control. Uh, same thing with focus. It's just telling it to focus forward, focus backwards. It doesn't actually know it's at X position or the zoom is at you know, 32 millimeters. It doesn't have that data. So you can't program it into a, a preset, which is a bummer. So without that, there was no reason to use that lens, which turned out to be good because the lens is not very fast. I think it's an F4.5. This lens that's on here right now is the um, 12 to 35 is the Lumix lens, the 12 to 35 f2.8. Has your autofocus, does not have power zoom, but it's a 2.8. So it's a much wider aperture, a lot more light. This lighting setup, I've got three big LED banks in here, um, plus the backlights, but those don't really count for this. That's just mood. These three lights are illuminating me, and I am all the way open at f2.8. And at the slowest aperture, at a 50th of a second on this camera, you can see the settings in here. So my iris is open all the way up. The shutter speed is at a 50th of a second. And I still had to add gain. Not a lot, but I had to add gain in there to get the exposure where it should be. So uh, if I got it, I could put a faster lens on there, but then I'd have even shallower depth of field. And while that may look cool and dramatic, if I lean forward and go out of focus, that's not kosher. So I've got to, you know, I've got to keep that, um, keep it some depth of field in here. So... Uh, and I am losing light because I'm going through the, um, what do you call it, the, the mirror for the um, teleprompter. So, and that's kind of a permanent installation. I don't use it for this type of show, but for other things I do, and I don't want to have to be adjusting the camera exposure every time whether I turn that on or off. So that's in there, so the exposure has to compensate for that. So that's, that's something to consider as well. Okay, um, that's everything on here. I think that's everything I wanted to talk about. So setup was relatively easy once I figured out the, or was told the um, channel you have to set the camera ID to the same input channel. Then everything fell into place from there. Uh, I've got the camera in full manual exposure. You can go auto as well, but let's go manual, keep it consistent so nothing changes on us. And then the, the white balance, that was the only real stickler. Getting the white balance right, couldn't get it exactly accurate, so I had to do little tweaks in there. But now that it's set, it is accurate. And as I said, it's accurate, but it's not. it doesn't have the look that I want. But that's why I've got these full-on DaVinci Resolve level controls in here, so I can dial in that look and get it looking how I want. So that's that. All right, I think that's everything. Um, let me see if there's some extra comments coming in. Oops, as my Facebook window refreshes, I did see some comments. Um, come back here, guys. Come on. Let me zoom out of this a little bit. Facebook's taking its time to load. See anything over on YouTube? I wonder if YouTube is loading the wrong window because I'm not seeing anything showing up here. Oh, well. If there's any comments on YouTube, I'm not getting to them. I will get to them afterwards. Come on. Facebook, behave. Where's the live broadcast from today? There it is. Okay. Um, I know there are comments. Where'd they go? There we go. Five comments. Come here. Florian. Florian is saying, oh, is the YouTube stream broken? Well, maybe it is. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's why I'm not seeing any comments here. So, and Florian's saying, wish you a nice Christmas. Thank you very much, Florian. I wish you a happy Christmas, happy holidays as well. Um, Brad and Florian, thank you for tuning in. I see a couple other people watching live as well, whoever you are. Thank you. And uh, that's it. Hey, happy holidays, you guys. If you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas to you. If you celebrate another happy holiday, happy holidays to you. I am shutting down next week. Between Christmas and New Year's, there will be no live broadcast. I will be uh, spending time with the family and possibly coming in here to do a little bit of build out in the studio. I don't want to build a whole new desk system, but I don't know. We'll see if inspiration strikes or if I can get my kids to help. Right. Um, so next week, there will be nothing. So that puts us back in here, not on January 2nd, because I don't think maybe I'll come in on January 2nd. Um, is what, what is that? That's a Monday. Maybe I'll come in on the second. Definitely be in on the third. So uh, we'll see. I don't know. Watch out for that. Maybe I'll come in on the second. But that's it. So thanks a lot, you guys. This has been fun. Hey, if, if this is the last of 2016, this whole thing has been a really fun experiment. I hope you're enjoying this whole photo moment thing. Um, I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun doing it. Uh, as I've said before, that we do have to make it profitable. So if you like the thing, head down to, there we go, there, 
uh, patreon.com slash photo joseph consider kicking in a shekel or two and uh, that would be awesome to help keep this thing up and running if um, you know if everybody who ever watched this thing put in a buck a month we'd be set that would be awesome but um, we're not there yet so do what you can and of course check out all the old videos over here photojoseph.com slash moments that'll take you to the youtube page where they're all embedded and of course as i mentioned before you can now watch this on on uh, iTunes. This is streaming on iTunes as well. Just look for the podcast on iTunes and you'll find it there. Yesterday's episode isn't up yet because it was a huge upload. And I forgot to do it. So it's going now. Anyway, that's that. Okay, guys. Um, thank you very much. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye-bye.